Thanks so much. All right. So great to be here. It's my first time in Budapest. I've always wanted to come, and it's been a delightful experience. So far, I was able to explore the city a bit uh, and had a couple of extra days. And wow, I'll be back for sure. So thanks so much for the invitation. Thanks for all your help, everyone here setting up the stage and, and getting the, the tent all set. So yeah, so we're going to talk about coaching. And we're, this is going to be an interactive session. Let's see if my clicker is working. Yeah, it is. All right, cool. So yeah, this is going to be interactive. Again, it is 90 minutes. Use the law of two feet. If at any time you need a break or go out, take a phone call, whatever, come back in, it's totally fine with me. Uh, the material builds on itself. So the beginning information all kind of comes together near the end. And so I want you to know that. And yeah, so just really glad you're here. Really glad you're here. So we're going to get started. I just wanted to tell you about a couple of leaders that I've worked with, and they've had a really big impact on my career. I've been in the software industry now for about 20 years. And I've been part of different startups. I'll share a little bit about myself before we dive deeper. Um, I, I've always, like, I, I don't know about you, but you know, in the work that I do, I coach a lot of teams. I work on different teams. I started on a web development team, had, was an interaction designer, was a writer. I've been working in cross-functional teams or coaching them for a very long time. And I'd always go to my mentors for advice when I'd have challenges. Like, for example, on the right here, these, you know they're founders because they're hanging up a whiteboard, right? Do what it takes, have a founder's mindset. Um, I want to tell you about Klaus here on the right. Early in my career, this, I was at a startup called Expert City. And the startup became very successful. I was on the teams that invented GoToMeeting and GoToWebinar. But I, like, you know, like many of you probably, I'd have issues with people, I don't know, you know, like, why, why is it so hard to work with that other person? And I'd go to Klaus and I'd go into his office and here's the thing, I'd leave his office and somehow he interacted with me in a way that I solved my own problem. And I always wondered, like, how did he do that? Like, what was it about my interactions with Klaus that he, like, I, I knew the answer and he just, asked me some questions and he listened. And then I was, I was able to kind of be more autonomous. And so I always really appreciated that. I always wondered, it's like some kind of Jedi mind trick or something, like how does he do this? And years later, you know, I'm looking back on this. This is when we were at a different startup called Appfolio, the second startup, which he co-founded with John Walker here. Over the years, I learned coaching. And using skills from coaching can help you help other people solve their own problems because they can. We don't always have to solve problems for other people. We don't have to tell them, this is how you do it, this is what you do. There is a place for that though, and that's in mentoring and teaching, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So I work at Procore Technologies for a software company located in Carpentria, California. We make software for the construction industry. So there's a lot of construction going on in Budapest. I noticed that right away. I'm keenly aware of construction because we build software to make the lives of people in construction better. And in my work, I work in our R&D department and I support, I don't know, 350, 400 people in the capacity that, that I have. I coach people to get better at what they do, director of engineering excellence. And so some of the skills that I'm going to teach you, I use every day. I use them in my interactions with the people I work with. I use them at home. I use them in other places. Yeah, so Procore, like I said, we make software for construction. Thank you to Procore for enabling me to grow professionally by giving talks all around the world. I appreciate the support. We have tools for the job site, and we have tools for managing construction projects. We have safety tools. We have a wide variety of tools. So thank you, Procore. Uh, yes, my past. So I have, you know, like I said, about 20 years in the industry working at different startups. My specialty is helping startups thrive at this point in my career, which is why I joined Procore, a very fast growing company. So I was early employee at a couple of different startups. We got acquired by Citrix uh, after we built GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar. 
was the 10th employee at a company called Appfolio, making software for the property management industry. I have 20 years of software as a service experience. At some point when I was at Appfolio, I learned about coaching, and I was trained in a school of coaching called Coactive Coaching. And I went to, I had like a weekend a month for five months of coursework, coached more than 100 hours, did a certification program, a credential program, that took a long, long time, this took years, and I got a credential from the International Coach Federation. If you're interested in digging more into this material and learning more about coaching and really going deep, I'm happy to help you with that and, and give you my thoughts. Uh, but the type of coaching that I'm gonna introduce you to is coactive coaching, unscripted coaching, coaching that involves deep listening and asking powerful questions and doing a variety of other things. I wrote a book about fast team change and growth called Dynamic Reteaming, which is team change patterns, soon to be on Amazon, currently on LeanPub. If you're in an environment where your teams change, and they all do, if I ask you, you know, like raise your hand if you've had a new person join your company in the past month. Okay, look around. You'll see the hands. Okay, you can put your hands down. Raise your hand if you've had someone leave one of your teams in the past month. Maybe they went to another team or another company, look around. So team change is inevitable. We might as well get good at it. That's the subject of the book. The best teams are not the ones that you try to keep the same and stable the whole time because the nature of the world is that things change. That's what the book's about. And now, like I said, I work at Procore. And I'm also a mother. I have two children, Samuel and Julia, and we live in Southern California. Here they are at a Dodger game. He's a big Angels fan though, so he went to a Dodger game. So yeah, so Workshop Alliance. So this is going to be a very interactive experience. We're gonna get up and move around. We're gonna do some pair work. We're gonna to try to make the most of this crash course in coaching. And so a few things, you know, would you be willing to experiment a little bit in here? Maybe raise your hand. Would you be willing to like, just go out of your comfort zone a little? I think to learn, you gotta push yourself. Some of the stuff might feel awkward. You, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. Um, are you willing to be a little bit active? Yeah. Okay, listening is also active, and we'll learn that. Can you tolerate messiness? You know, sometimes I screw up with my facilitation. Is that okay? Can, do I have permission to not be perfect? I love that. That, like, makes me feel more comfortable to facilitate this stuff. Um, you know, feel free to share ideas, ask questions. I'll give you a copy of the slides you can go to my website, HeidiHelfand.com, or through LinkedIn. You'll get all the slides, and I guess this is recorded, so. Um, we're gonna, I'm a very big fan of a movement called Liberating Structures. Has anyone heard of that? Okay, a few people. All right, so we're gonna do some liberating, I'm, I'm happy to introduce this to people that haven't heard of it because I feel passionately that we have a lot of meetings in our lives that suck the life out of us that we need to maybe delete or discard. Some liberating structures help with that. How do we bring aliveness to the work that we do to transform how we work? Liberating structures helps with that. It's the name of a book, Liberating Structures. Impromptu networking is the first interactive activity that we're gonna do, and it's from, it's a liberating structure. So anyway, thank you to the authors of Liberating Structures. Okay. So my question for you, in doing that, how was your listening? Fine. What was it like? Okay, so like physically, you got the input in your ear, you uh, kind of something happened in here, you comprehended it, kind of went out. Yeah, it's normal to get distracted. Who felt a little distracted at times? Like thinking about something else, yeah? It happens to me all the time. Sometimes it takes a lot of effort to focus out. So you can have your seat, take your seat. So coaching, what does coaching actually mean? You shared some impressions of coaching that you had with other people. Now my view of it is that it's a process. 
to help people maybe either catalyze a change that they want to make in their life, or it also could be about, you know, dealing with the change that has already happened, different skills. Things happen to us, we get reorged at work. Suddenly things change. Suddenly you have a new manager. And if that happened to anyone lately, you're assigned to a new manager. Okay, happened to me recently too. It's something that we have, right? Might feel a little awkward. So then we can talk to people about it. It could be that we feel like we need a change in our life. We feel rather stagnating. Happens to teams as well. If you master what you do, you might get to a point where you're in some sort of rigidity trap and we need a change. Sometimes it's just, especially if you're comfortable in your work, you have a good setup, you, you know how to do it with your eyes closed, it might be hard to go to a change. So coaching helps people you know, become something else, like get forward, do something different. And this is an edge theory of change from an organization called CRR Global and Ar Arnie Mandel also, they uh, cite his work. But it's basically this, we're in a current state, we're coaching someone, they're in a current state, we want to try to explore with them and get them to a future state, something different maybe something that they want. We talk about when we coach another person, it's their agenda. We're not trying to transfer what we want for them, but it's through a process we elicit what they want going forward to get them where they want to be. And after you do this for a while, you notice that if you just tell someone what to do or give advice or a recommendation, even with positive intent, that person will have less options. And you will notice that if you use these techniques, they will come up with things that you could have never thought of. We don't, we don't need to own the solution to someone else's problem. But there is a place for advice. We'll talk about that. So, yeah. So basically this. This is, you know, consulting and mentoring when we transfer our knowledge or our, our opinion about what someone should do is a valid thing to do as well. It's just not coaching, it's consulting or maybe mentoring, passing on, transferring knowledge. There's a place for that. Yeah. So listening is one of the main skills in coaching and controlling your listening, especially away from distraction, is a key skill. And again, to improve all the relationships in your life with your friends, with your family, if you have children, if you have a spouse, your neighbor, using these skills will help you improve your communication. It's a side effect. I use it all the time, especially tools that help me focus and show other people that I'm listening. So listening guides coaching. Yeah. So in this, we're gonna we're gonna go through three tools for communication, for your life, for coaching. And again, so the type of coaching that I'm going to teach you, you can buy a book that is called Coactive Coaching. If you like this material, you want to read something, I'd recommend reading that book or getting maybe the audio version. So we're going to become more self-aware of our listening. We're going to learn how to control it. And that's really key. It's really key for keeping presence with another person as well. Keeping your attention out. It's a big thing. So listening levels. We're going to talk about, this is the first tool and it's levels of listening. And I'm gonna do some hand signals too. Might be a little funky with this microphone. Um, but first level of listening, and I want you to do the hand signals with me too. Point, point to yourself like this. Okay, level one listening. It's all about you. It's when you're talking with another person and you're sharing about yourself or about your point of view. The conversational topic is an inward topic. It's something about you. It's not about the other person, okay? So it's inward focused listening. He's only, this dog here is only half listening. He's only has one ear up. It's, it's, it's also kind of like partial listening. So when we're in level one, maybe we're talking about ourselves, but it could also be kind of a distracted listening. You know, so it's all about you is a good way to remember it. This is why the, the thumbs are pointing inward. All about me. Distracted listening. When you're talking to someone else before and you were with one pair, switch pair, switch pairs, maybe you were thinking about, oh, I'd really like a coffee. 
Well, that had nothing to do with what you were talking about, but your mind wanders. It's what happens to us. What's, what's gonna, what am I gonna do for dinner? Oh, what am I gonna bring back to my company? You know, our mind is, is a, something that just goes in all different directions. So we really have to channel things and focus. So that's level one. Now level two, do this with your hands. It's almost like we're at the airport, kind of airplane. It's attention out. Direct focus on another person. Sometimes where I'm from, we might look into the eyes of another person. Is that socially acceptable here to look to make eye contact with another person? Is it polite? Yeah, might vary across different cultures. Um, one of the things that I do when my mind is drifting is focus out on the eyes to pay attention. I look at someone's face and that helps me f stay focused. Level two, very focused listening. Now level three, yeah, sharp focus over there. Oh, I got a couple more slides here. They're focused on each other. They look very happy. I had them pose for this photo. I thank them for doing that. But they're standing and they're facing each other and their attention's out. Our friend, many of us have teammates that are in other locations. How many of you have that situation? Use the video. It's one way to kind of focus the attention to see each other. Level two listening with distributed teams means you use video or you do something where you can see each other. You go out of your way to include them. All right, level three, this is the hand motion. Okay. Yeah, good, glad you're playing along. Body language and environment, also the vibe. Okay, so he's got level two listening with his ears. He's really kind of focused out, but it's also kind of the atmosphere, the room, the mood of the room. She look happy? No but she's not talking, we can't hear her, but we can see from her body language that she is not pleased. So it's kind of reading body language and reading kind of the mood, taking a guess. She's cracking up or starting to laugh, I think, because again, they, we posed, I had them pose for these. Okay, here's a, a, a big group of people. You could tell that the mood is rather like happy, they're all excited, kind of an upbeat mood, kind of vibe there. This is a little more somber. You know, we can kind of read the room. If I'm facilitating a retrospective with this group, I'm probably not gonna play an improv game because the, I wanna meet them where they are. The mood is, they're, they're dealing with some stuff. I can't remember what it was, but that, you know, it's a little, mood, mood's different. So recap, level one, inward focused. Level two, attention out, okay? and level three, body language and the environment, okay? When we coach, we wanna focus on levels two and level three. When you're in a one-on-one -on -one coaching situation with someone, or if you're coaching a team, you can apply this stuff to teams. You wanna focus out there, it's not about you. And then when your brain gets back to yourself and you're thinking about you know, the movie you wanna to see tomorrow, you gotta control your brain and focus out to levels two and three, okay? So let's lock it in. What I want you to do is, this is just a brief thing to try to lock in this learning. I want you to make this noise with your hands. Okay, keep doing that. Now listen only to the hand, your hands on your legs, okay? That's level one listening. Listen to the person next to you. Level two listening. Now listen to the sound in the whole room. Level three, okay. Good, levels of listening. All right, we're gonna move on, we're not gonna do that. All right, next tool. We need to show other people that we're listening. We can show other people that we're paying attention. And these are techniques to show that. We're busy. You know, we're running, who has a, a calendar and you have no free time in your calendar at work to do much because you're always in meetings? Is that for anyone? Yeah, so people I think need more attention and these are some techniques to show them that you care, right? 
mirroring and paraphrasing, we're going to talk about that. All right, they're having a deep conversation in here. And he's kind of, what level of listening do you think he's in on the right here? Probably level one. He's kind of distracted. He's focused on his computer. Who knows what's going on? Maybe he has something critical, and then his friend here walked up to him. You know, but if he's mirroring, you could kind of mirror the body language here. Like, look at these guys. Yeah, they're facing each other. He was sitting down before, but now he's standing up. If someone comes to your desk when you go back to work and you're sitting and they're standing and they come with a question for you or need to talk about something, you stand up. If you stand up and face them, it can show them that you are really listening and that you're caring. You might still care. You say, Heidi, well, but I still care. I'm just sitting down and busy. But it's like more respectful to kind of meet them at that level. So you meet them there. See, with, you know, my kids come, Mom, come over. I want to show you this thing on my iPad. It's very important that I look. And I, I, maybe they're sitting on the floor. I sit with them, same level, and I, I take that time to look. And I, I don't know about you, but I notice my kids, if I don't take that time and look, they keep looking back to see if I'm looking, if I'm paying attention. So you got to do that. So physical mirroring. You can mirror with words also, and it's just repeating words. This person says something, I went to, I went camping the other week and it rained on the tent, but we stayed dry. Oh, you stayed dry. So I repeated the words, stay dry. So those are techniques you can use in any conversation. I use it all the time, especially if somebody's talking to me about something and maybe I don't understand it. And maybe I, I tell them, hey, can you slow down a little bit? I might for for to show that I'm listening and for understanding, I might repeat some things back. So you can, this is another technique you can use. We do this in coaching. It's a, it's a technique for active listening, more active listening. All right, so here's an example. I love my new team. I feel very happy. And Hoover's like, oh, you feel happy. It, it doesn't sound like it adds much to the conversation. This is not deep super deep or anything, but it shows a caring. So you mirror. Took us all week, but we finished it. Ah, all week, huh? So we do this to show that we're listening, okay? So paraphrasing is just a, a little bit different. So maybe it's not the exact words back, but we're saying it back and we just pick different words, okay? Oh, I worked for it on our. I worked on it for hours. Then I found the solution. Okay, he's going to paraphrase it back. Ah, it took a while, but you found it. So he's just restating using different words what the other guy said. Okay, we went to see the customer and showed them our idea. Ah, cool. He showed it to him. So he's just saying it back using different words, paraphrasing. So we mirror with the exact words, we can par and we can do it with our body language as well, and we can paraphrase using similar words. It's just, again, another tool to show that we're listening. And when we coach, we, do, we can use these as well. You see when we were in here and we moved how it shifted the energy, you can deliberately do that in your meetings to add a little bit of liveliness when you coach one-on-one, -on -one, and, and if you want to deliberately try to shift the energy, let's say you're sitting, then you can stand up. You can try to stand up, and you might want to do that in the context of what's being talked about. If, someone, if you're coaching somebody and you're sitting down and someone talks about how excited that they are, this big accomplishment that they made, you can stand up together and you can cheer. Like, you can... You can move your bodies and we don't have to be constrained by the furniture. But we are often constrained by the furniture. How many people have conference rooms dominated by large tables? So you can't move around. It, oh, you have to make friends with your friends in the facilities department and try to influence the, the furniture so you can have more communication. It's one of my quests in life. I want to have the ability to move chairs. So anyway, let's build on this. Cool, so what questions, tool number three. So, so far we've talked about the listening levels, we talked about mirroring, paraphrasing. Now we're gonna talk about what questions. I'm teaching you something abridged. I'm focusing on the word what as the beginning, in, 
English word for the beginning of a, of a sentence. We're going to, in, in coaching, like if you read that coactive coaching book that I recommended, they'll talk about powerful questions. Okay, these are questions that evoke an insight or try to get the person to open up. They're a special kind of open question. In English, we contrast sometimes the open question and the closed question, or a closed question has like a one word answer. The open question allows people to say more. If I talk to you, if we're talking, we're coaching, or whatever it is that we're doing, we're conversing, and I say to you, say more, also a powerful question. So they're not limited to the word what, but for the purpose of this, we're going to focus on the word what. So the what questions that we want, the powerful what questions, are not about information gathering. So when you're meeting with someone and coaching them, how many of you have one-on-one -on -one meetings with people? Okay. If you're coaching some, if you're, how many of you are managers? Raise your hand if you're a manager. Okay, some of you are managers. If we want to develop each other and develop the people that we manage, use the one-on-ones for development, personal development, not only about information gathering. So this question here, for example, what do you plan to tell Bob when you see him next week? Okay. That is not a powerful question to evoke an insight or a new way of thinking for the person. This one is about gathering information. So that's not really the kinds of questions we want to ask when we're coaching. We want to be curious for the other person, not just get information that they could send us on an email. That's not what it's about. We're trying to develop and grow that other person. So the what questions that we want are not about information, information gathering. And we also do, you know, what's your favorite color? Blue. Okay, no, that it, it's not about gathering like certain short facts or the answer yes or no. It's not a yes, no question. Okay, they're, they're different than that. So we want questions to help the other person discover something. We want to get the whatever in their brain firing off so they have a new aha moment or an insight. And when they say to you things like this, it's a metric of like you've gotten through. Oh, I never thought about that. When, when you ask someone an open-ended what question or powerful question and they say, I'll have to think about that. Give me a minute. Or maybe they'll say, Gosh, that's a good question. And you'll notice a pause. And then you let the pause, you give it time. It's okay to have silence in all of these. It's not one question after the other, firing away. No, it's not that. It's just you ask a question and you wait. You don't ask two questions or three questions. You, you just ask one and then you wait. Sometimes when I'm coaching, I'll ask a question to try to get the other person to think, and then I'll think to myself of a better question that I should have asked. So then I have to manage that. That's my level one listening going off. So I gotta put that aside and focus on the first question. Just don't replace it with another question. Yeah, if it, we focus on the whole person is another thing, one of the coactive principles that we have is that people are naturally creative, resourceful, and whole. People are capable of solving problems. They got this. You don't have to tell them exactly what to do. We focus on the person and the person's learning. What did that mean for you? Oh, that was really important to you. It's a paraphrase back, let's say. So personal exploration versus information gathering. All right, so here's a little quiz few questions here. Did you enjoy our offsite last week? Powerful or no? No, not really. No, no. All right. What does the situation mean to you as a person? Powerful or not? Yeah, powerful. And then the last one. How will you get started? That's a, 
a tricky one. Yeah, it's powerful, but maybe a little less powerful than the second one. So the second one kind of anchors to the person, their experience. The third one's more about like helping them solve a problem. And that's, you know, that's a valid thing to do. You know, I mean, I started at the beginning of this, and I was like, I have all these problems, and I go talk to my mentors, and then I leave and I solve my own problem. You know, it's a, it's a real thing to have a problem to solve. But there's something about the personal development approach that makes it a little stronger. Because we, we want to help the person who is creative, naturally creative, resourceful, and whole get further and develop. It's like more of a development approach. This is more like a how-to, kind of the nuts and bolts of doing it, um, which is fine. You know, there's a place for stuff like that. Yeah, so here's some other examples with what questions, you know. This is level three listening. We've got a lot of wind in here. That was cool, yeah, that was powerful, right? There's like a statement about it, amplifying the powerful question concept. What's important about this? You know, what else? Just something like that, asking someone, oh, what else? Just like I said, say more before as another powerful question. If you Google powerful questions, or if you get that coactive book near the end, there's a link to some resources. They have, there's hundreds of these, I mean, you could just make them up. What do you want? This is a very powerful question. When someone comes to you and at the beginning of a coaching conversation, maybe they'll be venting. Do you know what I mean by venting? When, so, let's say someone is very upset and they come to you for a meeting for help about this and then they talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and you could tell that they're very upset so you let them do that we call that venting okay so you let them do that i tend to let people do that maybe until they seem like they're empty until they don't have much more to add but if it's going to take up our whole meeting i will interrupt them and cut them off i'll say okay wait now tell me what do you want? It kind of cuts through the story. So that's another thing that we want to do, right? Or, or I love this one. There's a book that I read recently. I think it's called The Coaching Habit. It might, it's one of those books that you see in an airport. It might, might be a Harvard or recommended by Harvard Business Review. If somebody comes to you with a problem about someone else, that's a common thing. Like, oh gosh, I just having such a hard time with this person on my team and this and that and, and the other thing and they're going on and on about this other person, you can ask the first question, which I got from that book, which is, well, what's important about this? You know, what does it mean to you? You can't solve the problem about the other person. You're here coaching the other person. So these are some examples. What's the first step? Okay, so this is, this is another thing. What, what are you gonna try? You know, again, it's a powerful question. You know, they come and, you know, there's, it's a judgment call, what's more powerful than, than something else. So when we coach, we listen deeply in that level two and level three to determine what questions to ask. When I first started coaching, I really wanted to get good at this. I really wanted to ask the right question and I, I put some questions by my computer monitor because then I thought, oh, when I coach later, I can just, you know, how can I internalize this stuff? I think some of it's kind of like language acquisition. You, all of you speak at least two languages. That's my guess here. Um, it's, it takes a little while to acquire a language. You might read, you might be able to take the test, do the grammar, but to speak it and do it, it takes a little time. Some of the stuff you have to acquire, it takes a little time, but you practice and you do it over and over and over. So, And so you do that deep listening to connect, and then the questions come to you. So this is a, an emergent coaching approach. So let's put this all together into a coaching conversation. So I've been teaching you some kind of dis discrete skills without much of a context. Let's look at a context now of a coaching conversation. And I do it like an arc. If you remember that, you know, I should really put a triangle here like that change arc I had in the beginning of the talk. Do it kind of like an arc. Our coaching conversations have a specific beginning and they have an end. They do not go on and on. So at the beginning of your coaching conversation, you can ask a question like, well, what's on your mind? 
or even more specifically, when you meet for that one-on-one, -on -one, uh, what do you want coaching on? It could be that you're meeting with someone and they start to talk about something and you can say to them, oh, you know, I was just at a, I was just at craft, I was at a workshop and I learned some new skills about coaching. Would you like coaching on that? We can try a coaching conversation. So like we usually invite people into these conversations. You don't really do it in the wild without telling someone. That can feel weird. People don't want to be, we, that's stealth coaching. We don't, we don't coach without talking about the fact like, would you like to have some coaching? So you typically, people know that they're being coached when you're coaching them. So that's important. Otherwise it could feel odd if I'm just, you know, walking down the street with my friend and suddenly they start a coaching conversation that doesn't feel appropriate, it feels a bit odd. So you can, if you have a regular one-on-one, -on -one, maybe you have a regular kind of cadence to your meetings, they expect to meet with you. Um, or you can invite someone to have a conversation. So you start it out by clarifying the topic, getting something for them, and then you can paraphrase it back. Let's say they start talking about um, the situation on the team, and then you can paraphrase it back. Oh, you, wanna, you want coaching on the situation with the team. Okay, all right, so then you, you go from there. So you clarify the topic. The, this is the place in the arc where the three tools come into place, which we have been working on so far. So they clarify the topic. Actually over here is probably, especially if they're upset, it could be some kind of venting that I talked about before when they vent or they talk on and on and on about the situation and you might let them get empty or you might interrupt them, right? And then we dig into the listening. So we want to be facing them. We want to mirror the body language. We want to see their eyes, ideally. You can do some of this stuff over the phone without seeing people. It's a different kind of listening, a different kind of feel. So you're gonna listen in those levels two and three. This is not listening for yourself. This is listening for them. You put your attention out and you can mirror and paraphrase to show that you've heard some of the things that they said. Show that you are listening. Restate back, you can confirm things. And then you wanna ask some what questions to move it on. So this is an arrow on purpose. This is a forwarding action. We want to forward the action and deepen the learning. We want to move it forward. We want it to go somewhere. We want this to be a directional conversation. We're trying to help them get from here to there. Maybe there's a new way that they want to be. Maybe somebody comes to you for coaching on, they have to go to a meeting and it's a regular meeting and they feel very intimidated about it and it doesn't feel good when they go to the meeting. So maybe they, after coaching, they decide that they wanna be strong or they wanna show up at the meeting feeling strong. So that's a valid thing. That's not something they do, it's just how they're gonna be. Usually when I coach, you know, we're all doing, we're doing societies, right? We, we're very busy, do, 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 we, we make all this stuff, you know, get these features and, we, you know, we don't want to be a feature factory, but we, you know, as we go from one thing to the next, we're very action oriented. So sometimes focusing on, well, how do you want to be in that situation is helpful. I want to be more calm. And so then when they, let's say they want an action like something like that, you can, you can help them come up with a gesture so they remember. If I want to be strong in a meeting, let's say maybe, maybe I say, well, what's a gesture that you could just, do before you enter that meeting. Maybe they'll do something like this. Some kind, of, some kind of like power pose. Or maybe a gesture that they want to be more calm. Maybe they'll do something like this. So those are structures to help them remember. So we want to get them into an action or a being. Or maybe they tell you, I'm going to go have that conversation. I'm going to go talk to that person that I was having those issues with. Crucial Conversations is an awesome book, a wonderful book about having difficult conversations, Crucial Conversations, Joseph Grenny and et al. And then we usually wanna plan a follow-up at the end. So this is a complete arc. So we, we coach directional action, we 
action or being, and then we're like, okay, well, let's say they decide at the end of the coaching to have a conversation with another person. I might say, okay, let me know how that goes. Do you want to send me an email or do you want to Slack me or you, do you want to tell me about it next time? So something like this, you can work out, sometimes people call it accountability, and different people that you coach want different types of accountability, so that's something that you design together. And so, yeah, there's, there's more to this, but this is a taste. And so what we're gonna do we're, is we're gonna practice this with a partner. And so, what I'd like you to do is stand up and find a partner, and then I'll give you further instruction. Okay, thank your partner for the coaching. And then take your seat. Good work. So, what was that like? Ah, okay, so the question is, we were talking about what questions, can we use the other W uh, words like why or uh, where or whatever. So you can use any question you want. Some people say that if you ask a question starting with why, it gets people too much in their heads and analyzing and maybe looking too far in the past. We are not, this is not therapy. So we, with coaching, we make a distinction between coaching and therapy. We're not trying to dig into someone's past and understand what happened in their childhood or maybe what was the reason behind this. Like we wanna shy away from that. We, we wanna avoid that type of thinking. And I, I, I also need to teach you and tell you that we want to, when we are coaching another person, uh, hold that thought. So, so yes, you can ask questions with other words like where or who or what, like you can ask anything. I would not focus on trying to get the reason for something or the reason behind something. I would leave that aside. So there's that. Um, what I want to say is sometimes when you're coaching, especially in a professional context, it could be that people, you, you know, a lot of us, you're very, I'm sure, very trusted in your, in your jobs and in your roles. People might confide things in you that are better served by another person. So what we do is refer people to, to others. If somebody brings something to you and you're having a one-on-one, -on -one and you're not a ther let's say you're not a psychologist, you're not a therapist. I don't know if anyone is in here. Is anyone? No, okay. So we wanna refer people to other professionals who have the skill set to, to handle topics that might be beyond us. So as a coach, I work with my company, I work with referring people elsewhere if appropriate. So I want you to keep that in mind. So coaching is not about going into the past, understanding the reasons, any of that kind of discipline. We refer people when we are challenged with topics that are outside our boundaries. We are more starting from here and going to the future. This is a future looking thing. This is about helping people get from here to a place that they want to be. So I think that's a very important thing to talk about. If you want to read more about that, the International Coaching Federation, which has a website, it's the ICF, they gave me my credential. They have a wonderful, they have an online course as well as information about ethics and coaching, okay? And the other thing I want to note is that sometimes, in fact, it happened to me probably last month, someone came to me with an issue uh, about uh, the challenges that they were having with their manager and it became clear to me after a certain point that it was outside of my scope and I said, you know, I think you really should talk to this other person who's involved in the people operations kind of human resource about this challenge that you're having because it's sort of outside of my scope. So that, that is something that you can do as well. So what are some other impressions that you had from the brief coaching that you did? Uh, 
Okay, so um, the question was, it, sometimes it seems like people are already going in a, in a direction that seems good for them. And do you have to suggest something, maybe that? And so what I would say there is kind of explore that with them. Be curious about it. Help them develop it. You could say something like, and it's not a what question, but it's the same purpose. Tell me more about that. What would that bring you? Like help them open it up and explore it and get further. Well, what will you do with this? So you kind of, maybe that's what's good for them. Maybe that's what they want. Okay, so you're telling me about how uh, you wanna go have that conversation and do this. Well, what, what do you want? And then maybe they'll continue going in that direction or maybe not. So we kind of, yeah, so it sounds like they already had some sort of forward momentum. So I would do that. Other questions? Yes. Mm, yes. So I wonder, so what he said was, and I will paraphrase, again, up here you can, if you follow on the meta level, I'm asking powerful questions and I'm paraphrasing and I'm trying to mirror when I'm up here. So you use these skills with groups as well in facilitation. So, so he felt that uh, he heard the challenge expressed to them, to him, and he felt like he had a solution for them. And it was like an inner struggle to keep that solution to himself and not give that advice. Did anyone else have that sort of struggle? Look around, look at those hands. Very, very common. We want to solve problems. A lot of us get praised at our work for being the one with the solution or solving. Here, we want ownership of that solution to be with the person. We want, it could be that our solution is not appropriate for them. If we give them the solution, we have that sort of power. It's our solution, not that. It's a different type of ownership. We don't want the ownership of the coach. We want that ownership out there. We, you know, we're helping that human be better. Do, do what they want. And also, we limit their options. They might, if we tell them, oh, I think you should do this immediately, it could be that they had four other ideas and two of them were better for them. I was, uh, one second, I was with uh, coaching a, a person for a while, and, and I will say she wanted my professional opinion about a lot of things. So what we would do, a pattern that we would use when we started a coaching conversation, I would do a coaching conversation like I've described here, but then after, she'd be like, okay, Heidi, tell me what you really think. And then I'd share my opinion. I do, I, you know, I'm an int I function a lot as an internal consultant. I have thoughts about different things. It is valid to share an idea. What technology should I use for this? I'm not gonna go into a coaching conversation. I might suggest a technology. It might be some consulting. It could be that you're having a coaching conversation and then you realize that maybe it's more appropriate for me to mentor this person about this topic. Maybe the, the nature of what they're talking about, let's say they're talking about test-driven development and you know some like techniques with it, like you're, you're going to go into mentoring or teaching for that. So what some coaches do is make a deliberate signal to show that they are shifting. They'll say, okay, let's just hold this for a minute. Let me put my mentor hat on, get that out of the way, and then you go back to the coaching. Some will say that that is not coaching. ICF, we stick in the coaching and we leave the mentoring and teaching outside. Um, yeah, but it, it's totally natural to want to give the solution, but we, we hold it if we, if we truly want to have a coaching conversation. Okay. So what if they have a, something and they have two different options, which one should I take? And I mean, you can help them explore these different options to an extent, which one would you take? Like if you're in the context of a coaching conversation, you could even say to them, let's explore both of these options and the pros and cons of each of these options. And then at the end, okay, well, which one would you choose? And then at the end, let's say they're like, I wanna choose this one and here's why. You can deliberately say, okay, I'm gonna put my mentor hat on or my manager hat or whatever hat you're wearing, my, my mentor, teacher hat, and you could say something like, well, 
I think you missed a few of these things, and here's here's what I would suggest. Like we don't want to, we, we need to use our professional opinion for when we coach and when we mentor or teach, right? And so so through practice, you'll I think you'll get good at distinguishing these things. Hey, other questions? Actually, we do have a lot of questions on Slido. They okay. arrive throughout the session. Okay. So I would recommend, can you guys please switch to Slido so we can Slido. read? Slido. Slido okay. it is. Cool. So we can take a look at the questions. So like, shouldn't just everyone practice these listening techniques by default if they care for others? What do you think? Why do we forget often how to human? God, yeah, it's such a, it's such a great question. I think these apply. Would you agree that you could use this with your family or your friends? Raise your hand if you think that. I use it with my children. I will admit to you that I recently had a performance review. How many in your companies you do performance reviews? Okay. I was told that I need to get better at my listening. Okay. And I teach this stuff. There's an irony there. If this stuff is hard. We're wired to be over here. Maybe it, there, there's a wonderful article with like the neuroscience of coaching. And I'm trying, I, I always want to integrate that stuff in the slide deck and I don't. Um, by Ann, Bet Her, the woman is named Ann Betts. And you know that we have these pathways in our brains that go this way and with coaching and with listening, we want to go this way. It's, it, it could be a habit, it could be a practice. I think that book I mentioned earlier that I bought in the airport was called The Coaching Habit. Keep doing it. What to do when confronted by an introvert who is horrified at hearing what questions and won't respond enough to start conversation or exploration? Yeah, so, you know, all people are different. Um, we were talking earlier about like stealth coaching. Like you, want, you need permission to coach someone else. Let's say you're with a person and, and they identify as being more introverted. It could be that you make an offer. Throw, we call it, sometimes I call it throw spaghetti on the wall. Like you might hear something, you might think, oh, you know, would you like a co to have a coaching conversation? I think I've learned these techniques and I can help you kind of explore the things that are best for you. Would you be willing to have a conversation like this? It would take about a half hour. And maybe they say yes and maybe they say no. So I would kind of give that as an opportunity. But we don't force someone to do this. If you are a manager, do not force people into coaching. It's something that we want to be respectful and we want to invite someone to a coaching conversation. It's a special kind of conversation. You could even do something like, hey, you know, I learned these techniques. Um, I want to show you, I want to give you like a sample of what it might be like. And we can interact and I can ask you an open-ended what question. And would you, would you want to try it just as a little example or I can give you a taste of it? And maybe you're going for a walk, let's say, and, and you just start like, let's pick a topic and, you, and then you ask a question. So you can kind of like test it out with people. Doesn't repeating feel stupid in real life? That is a really good question. Does it feel like we're bizarre or strange if we start repeating what people say? I would say try it. When you leave this, this tent and you meet people out here and you're talking to your colleagues and they say something to you, repeat something back, see if they notice. See if they notice that you're doing this sort of technique. I bet you that they won't notice. Try paraphrasing what they say. I bet you they probably won't notice. Test it. Wow, I'm totally going to do that. Try it. I'm I think totally. there's a power. I think it's like I, I did a facilitation course once by a group called Community at Work. Mm -hmm. They're in San Francisco. There's a wonderful book called The Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision Making by a man named Sam Kaner. He also, also has a co-author. And it was about facilitating large groups. And one of the main things that you do when working with groups or teams is paraphrase back. Like whenever you're asking me a question, I'm paraphrasing you back. Um, like it's one, it, there's a power to that. If you leave this tent and for the rest of time, you paraphrase back, you say things back in, in other words, uh, people are not gonna notice, they're gonna feel more heard and it's, it, it can be more of an inclusive conversation. Powerful questions seem uneasy or aggressive. How can I make them feel safe? Powerful questions feel uneasy or aggressive. How can I make them feel safe? One of the things that you can do 
with this is you don't have to ask those particular questions that I put on the screen. Google powerful questions and take a look at some examples. Maybe there are some things that might feel better to you to experiment with or to try. Even if you say it to someone, um, can you tell me more? Will you say more? Say more. Or please describe that in greater detail. I mean, you can, you can phrase things in all different ways. This is a rather interesting question and actually many people liked it too. Why is it important to let the other person know that you are having a coaching conversation? Why can't it happen naturally without the other person knowing about it? Mm -hmm. Remember that coaching arc where first we, we talk about the topic, then we use the listening, paraphrasing, mirroring, powerful questions. We try to get them in action and being, and then we try to plan a follow-up with them. I think towards as we've been talking about, a lot of those listening techniques you can use in the wild, you might repeat someone, you might paraphrase someone, but if you're kind of bringing it to a close, it might feel odd to someone that you're saying, oh, can you let me know uh, after you have that conversation how it goes? Like, it, it can feel odd to someone to say, okay, you plan to do, uh, you plan to go like this at the end of uh, every meeting, uh, send me an email once you've done that twice. I mean, some of the accountability might feel unnatural. Sometimes people don't wanna be coached, so we ask permission. It's just a, they, 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 they don't need you to help them get to an action or a being. They don't want it. So we coach people that want to be coached. We, don't, we never force someone into it. We always invite. And we have time for these two questions, so okay. it's wonderful. Do you use psychoactive techniques or any spirituality for mind setting? Mind setting is necessary for coaching or not? Is it not important? Okay, psychoactive techniques or spirituality or that kind of stuff. Um, I don't think so. I, 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 nothing comes to mind here. That pretty much what I, I do is you know, I just gave you a taste of it. So no, I don't use any particular, uh, I'm curious what, what this means in greater detail. Um, so whoever asked that, I'll be around so we can talk about it. Um, but I don't, uh, like, I don't personally like go somewhere to try to like get in the zone for a while and then do something. I, yeah, I just do kind of the stuff that I shared. I love the next question. Can you be your own coach? Can you be your own coach? Sometimes I talk to myself and then I answer my questions. Um, I, you know, maybe, maybe there's things that, maybe there's some of this that you can do that you can apply to yourself. Uh, I, I'd be curious about this. I would say, you know, wh why don't you try it? Let, you know, I'd be curious how that goes. I think part of the, uh, part of a coaching situation is being present with someone, paying attention, listening, helping someone feel heard and Sometimes we won't ask ourselves questions that draw ourselves out, so it's helpful to have a partner to do it with you. Thank you so much. These questions are not going to disappear. You are going to receive them next week. Okay. So you can, and also you, you can still find Heidi around. Uh, I have two very important messages to give you. Number one is that we did what we did yesterday. All the rest of the lunch that was remained were taken